Okay, I believe this is where we finished last time. So we'll close these. There we go. All right. Um, we're going to start with this first line, the last line. Uh, today is indeed um, Sunday, January 21st, down under. Saturday, January 20th. I believe we're heading into the first day of Aquarius. If I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah. We have a few Aquarians here among us. And uh, let's begin. Let's do this one line here just to begin with. Okay, here we go. Ready? I'll give it to you and you give it back. That much? Okay. We'll do the very same amount in English, and please read along with me just this much. Ready? Here we go. Together. Because the Bodhisattva accomplishes wisdom such as this, his body within a single Buddha land rests unmoving. Okay. What have we got? This is the background for everything that's going to be explained today. Let me give you the story. What's going on is we're in the eighth ground, the eighth stage of the Bodhisattva's 10 stages, which is a big long chapter in the Avatamsaka, Flower Garland Sutra. And it's talking about a Bodhisattva who has completely transformed his own conscious mind into wisdom. It's the same person, but his functioning now is very, very different because of what he's cultivated. He has employed the uh, practices of a bodhisattva to change his body and mind. And there are names for what has happened. And one of the names is he's gone from practices that require effort to effortless practice. In Chinese, it's called Wu Gong Yong Hang. It's practice, it's the functions of his mind now work without his needing to formulate in his mind how to do it. He doesn't pose the thought, oh, now I'm going to save this living being. And it functions all the same. And the sutra goes on to describe how it functions. And we've been listening to the text just go on about how the bodhisattva's ability to help is magnified to an exponential amount. For example, if you were able to, if you're a nurse and you're able to administer, uh, take the temperature and administer pills to one patient in five minutes, the Bodhisattva can now do that to a million patients in a fifth of the time, in a single minute. So just some huge factor of uh, enormity has happened because of what? Because of the, this change that's happened inside the Bodhisattva. And step by step by step, we watched how that was prepared, what led to that state, and then the state itself, there was a big change. And it wasn't at all for sure that it could happen. The Bodhisattva, there was all kinds of doubts. And the Buddhas had to appear to the Bodhisattva to guarantee that he or she got across the threshold. And then when he did, everything was different. And the sutra went on to talk about how it was different. So uh, this drama in the sutra and we, what we're witnessing is challenges, obstacles, difficulties in the path of somebody who's on an, a very steep and precarious uh, mountain mm, trail that has safety nets, but consequences, right? Every step the Bodhisattva makes has a consequence. And he's not to the top, but the path is clear. And although it's narrow and difficult, you can get there. And past this one particular threshold that happened in our eighth ground, eighth stage, 
the bodhisattva is guaranteed, they say, all the way to Buddhahood. He has reached a stage called no further retreat, Abhivartaka, Utvedran. And it's a, um, it's a turning point. So this is spiritual drama. Right? Um, what do we have to compare with it? I, I spent years in the seminary um, reading about spiritual heroes, right? We hear about Joseph Campbell wrote about the hero with a thousand faces and the spiritual journey. And uh, Mircea Eliade at the University of Chicago wrote about how the same theme pops up all over the world in all these different cultures about some man or woman who is different from his brothers and sisters, her brothers and sisters, who is different from everybody in the village or the town, who isn't satisfied with simple answers, with the ordinary uh, goods and rewards of a life well lived, but instead pushes the boundaries. Somebody who is willing to exchange discomfort in order to get extraordinary rewards. Um, we have a, a volcanic mountain here in Queensland, in New South Wales, actually called Mount Warning. And it's one of the things that visitors or even locals can do if they're motivated is see the sunrise from the top of Mount Warning. To do it, you have to get up really, really early and walk far in the dark um, along these uh, dripping uh, rainforest trails till you get to the vista point. And the sunrise from the top of Mount Warning is one of those famous views, famous sights. And you have to put out to get there. You have to actually exert yourself to get to the top. But everyone who does says, never forget it. It was spectacular. So that's the kind of person that this sutra is talking about. And our bodhisattva faced the obstacles, put out the strength, uh, made the hike up to the, the path, and crossed over the threshold and is now safely on the eighth ground. What we're going to read about, what we hear about today from now on, is what this allows the person to do. The so what after. You know, you think, wow, that was amazing. So what? Well, here's the so what, and we get to hear today. The uh, If you wanted to say in a word what it is, teaching. This bodhisattva is able to teach now the way he or she never could before. And the teaching is based on, there's one thing to know. I, I made some notes. Let me see, I'll bring up these notes. Um, the bodhisattva now functions like a life coach, but he's also a death coach, life and death. Um, bodhisattva is here to teach us about how to live in a whole new way um, that brings meaning and value to everyday existence. He's a life sheng si, uh, Jiao Huan, right? Jiao Lian, right? A life and death coach. So um, this, there's one more thing I wanted to show here. Let me move this up. We'll look at it right here. This is the whole text that we're studying is based upon what are called vows. And in the Mahayana tradition, these vows really matter. They're significant because they carry you past a place where ordinary people would give up or where you, as an ordinary person, would give up. The vows carry you beyond that, take you into uh, uncharted territory and allow you to continue. The first of those, the number one most important one, is called the Bodhi Vow. The Chinese is... We'll find it. Puti, pu, 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 where it go? Puti, and there it is, right there. Pu, ti, shin in Chinese. Here it is in Chinese. We'll make that bigger for people. Oh, we're getting to the limits of my RAM, I can see. Okay, puti, shin, there it is. 
the known also as the Bodhi resolve, also known as the Bodhi Chitta. That's a Sanskrit name that many people are familiar with. Bodhi resolve. So this is what um, powers the Bodhisattva's continued extraordinary effort, right? And if you're an athlete or have been around folks who compete in athletic competition, this would you'd be right at home with this kind of thing. It's the, the wish to excel, right? To find out what you're capable of, this Bodhi resolve. And our Bodhisattva has been doing this. This is um, what is the basis of this entire chapter. So kind of heroic, in fact, very heroic. And the hero's journey is uh, one of these stories that that you discover once you poke around in folklore, in anthropology, in stories of um, pioneers, right? Uh, maybe it even involved your grandparents. We are such a land of immigrants. And <laughs> I say we, I'm in Australia, right? And uh, other than the indigenous folks who, who lived here, who still live here, who are the, uh, the original stewards of this land and territory, other than those folks, we're all immigrants in Australia. My grandparents immigrated from Ireland to Canada and from Scotland to Texas on two sides. My story is the ordinary story, not extraordinary at all. Everybody in the room there in Berkeley, California, whom I'm looking at, came from somewhere else, or your parents did, or your grandparents did. Uh, how about that? In California, right there in the Bay Area, it's the Ohlone people and the Miwok people who were the original stewards of the land and whose elders carried the wisdom and held the wisdom. So it's a very elegant um, thing that happens here in Australia. I'm going to get my actual language here. Um, hold on. There it is. The um, after reconciliation here with the indigenous people, which happened during the, the tenure of Prime Minister Hawk, is that right? Who did it first? Who who was the first the Prime Minister who did the reconciliation? Do you remember Eddie? Okay, Bob Hawk, yeah, might have been. Um, the white folks um, said, uh, we came and did uh, harm to the original owners of this land and made it a custom, it's not a law, it's a custom, that whenever there's a public gathering, one of the things you say before is we acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and their continuing connection to land, sea, and community. We pay our respects to them and their cultures and to their elders, both past and present. And that's a beautiful statement because it allows the culture to carry through you and it puts you in a position to be able to receive that wisdom that was here before you and won't stop with you if you acknowledge that there is this wisdom, that the elders hold it, that you are part of the land, not apart from it. You're certainly not an owner of the land. This land had an owner when you came. Every time I hear that statement done with grace and with dignity, it never fails to give me a sense of grounding and connection to uh, the planet and to the humans and our part in it. So that's a very beautiful thing. 
America could certainly benefit by adopting something similar. Instead of trying to build walls to keep uh, others who are different than me away, uh, instead it connects me gracefully into the net of humanity and it makes my life so much richer and it makes my sense of community so much deeper and I don't have to worry about feeling lonely and afraid of the other. So here's our Bodhisattva, right, who is uh, now able to do what? Able to appear to teach in multiple ways, wherever he or she goes, they feel a connection to the point where the people who they're trying to teach immediately accept them and their, their wisdom to improve their lives. How powerful is that? So what just happened in the sutra? What happened was the bodhisattva accomplishes wisdom like that and he can sit, here he is within a single Buddha land. Bodhisattva is walking, standing, sitting or lying down and you don't see anything different. He rests, unmoving. The Chinese said, right? Qi shen bu dong. He's just right there. Body doesn't go anywhere. His body doesn't move. But what happens? Look at. He makes his body appear within inexpressibly many Buddha lands assemblies. All right. What kind of magic is going on whereby this bodhisattva can be sitting right here, just like our Buddhas on the altar is a bodhisattva. This is Manjushri or is that Samantabhadra? It's Samantabhadra. Okay. And yet, without moving from his original place, he can appear in inexpressibly many. Bukha Shua, no way to talk about how many places this bodhisattva appears at the same time without any change, visible change taking place. Okay, that takes a lot of deep connection. So let me say it again. The sutra says, at this point, because of the wisdom, this bugong yong hung, this effortless wisdom that's now functioning through the bodhisattva, because of his meditation, because of her practices and vows, this bodhisattva can be here and everywhere at the same time. And you don't see any any movement. Nothing leaves this body to go out. And in the other places, you don't see anything arrive. And yet the phenomenon is really happening of simultaneous appearance in different places at once. She whiz. That's pretty amazing. Um, Sam, could I ask you to take that book stand away? That gives me an interesting... Here is Sam helping out. There we go. Okay. Ah, we should have done some stage dressing before we started. Thank you. And while you're here, if you still have a hand, move that. Great, thanks. Okay. What's going on is one of the, what's called the Huayan Shi Shen Man. There's one of the 10 gateways to mysterious ness, mysterious qualities of the Avatamsaka Sutra that says this phenomenon of interpenetrating without any obstruction is where, where does this come from? Who like rents this out? Uh, how long is the contract? Uh, can you return it if you don't like it? Is it something that you buy off of Amazon.com? None of that. It's not a commercial, it's not commercially available. It's innate, inherent in you as you sit right where you're sitting. Everybody's got this ability. It doesn't come from anywhere else than the human mind. When you boot up this program, that's computer language for, because it just works. It's, it's good borrowed language. When you enable, when you invoke this function in your human nature, these abilities arise. The Avatamsaka Sutra 
describes it more fully, more easily than any other text. But you can find this very same phenomenon happening in other sutras. For example, let's talk about the Lotus Sutra. Everybody likes the Fahua Jing, the Lotus Sutra. And the Lotus Sutra talks about Guan Yin Bodhisattva in chapter 25, where it says, Ying Yi He Shen, De Du Zhe, Ji Xian He Shen, Er Wei Shuo Fa. Whatever physical body is required to take this person the next step in their spiritual journey, Guan Yin Bodhisattva appears in that body and speaks Dharma for him. And then it goes through 32 different bodies where Guan Yin does just that. And it's like, gee, that's amazing, right? There it is in the sutra. These sutras are what they are training manuals. They're how-to books saying, right? This is a function of human nature, but human nature at a whole new level at a level we haven't seen before, unless you read the sutra. But the sutra has been in humanity's purview for 2,500 years. It's always here, but like never not, what do you say? It's not available unless you opened it, had somebody explain it, and had the required language base to understand it, to read it and understand it. So there it is. Now we've got it. Master Hua said, I want you to understand these things. I'll explain it. You translate it. And we did. And here they are. Is it a sacred scripture? Yeah. Is it Buddha language? Yeah. Is it the possession of any spiritual caste or clan or priesthood? No. It's public domain. These texts are creative commons or would be if somebody took out the license because nobody owns it and it's got no patent on it, no copyright. It's given to people so that if you too have this altruistic wish to benefit others, here's how. Problem is it's hard to believe. Science can't explain it. The mind of duality, right? The mind that requires everything to be reduced to its lowest common denominator, the reductionistic scientific theorem doesn't work. But what comes closer is things like quantum theory, where you can't use a linear explanation for this phenomenon here causing this effect over here, but it's happening, right? In between, where's the machine that makes this result come from this cause? It's, you need another theory to explain it. Doesn't mean it's not happening or not true, right? So interesting, right? Science, cutting edge stuff, uh, wants this avatamsaka, cutting edge physics. Okay, let's take our next step into the text. So we've got this principle of unmoving from one place yet appearing in others. Okay, we're going to read down and read. Let's read. I'm going to read. Don't don't try to follow me. It's too long. I won't wait for you. But we're going to read this this chunk right here. Here we go. Fo zi ci pu sa sui zhu zhong sheng shen xin xin jie zhong zhong chi bie yu bi fo guo zhong hui zhi zhong Shen 夜莫天中,都衰天,都衰托天中,花了天中,他花自在天中,魔中,犯中,乃至阿加尼之托中中,各随其类而为现行。Okay, okay, long section. Here we go. Now, 
let's try to read this together in unison. Um, we, mm, it's a problem with the latency. My voice has to go, has to go through the, the pipes of the internet all the way over to America and back. So maybe some of you read silently if you want to, but uh, if you can keep up, that's okay. If it sounds funny on the speaker, understand that my voice might've got tired by Hawaii and kind of, you know, took a break and, okay, here we go, ready? Disciples of the Buddha, this Bodhisattva adapts himself to all the various differences in bodies, faith and understanding of living beings and appears within their assemblies in their Buddha lands. That is to say, he appears as a Shramana within assemblies of Shramanas. He appears as a Brahman within assemblies of Brahmans. He appears as a Kshatriya in, ah, is that right? Did we get, wait, 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 wait. Shaman, Bolon, yes, yes, okay, sorry, I panicked here. We got, that's right, can't continue, let's start over. Disciples of the Buddha, this Bodhisattva, adapts himself to all the various differences in bodies, faith, and understanding of living beings, and appears within their assemblies in their Buddha lands. That is to say, he appears as a Shramana within assemblies of Shramanas. He appears as a Brahman within assemblies of Brahmans. He appears as a Kshatriya within assemblies of Kshatriyas. In each assembly, in the same way, whether it be an assembly of Vaishyas, an assembly of Shudras, an assembly of lay people, an assembly of the four kings of the heavens, an assembly of the heaven of the 33, an assembly in the Suyama heaven, an assembly in the Tushita heaven, an assembly in the heaven of bliss for transformations, an assembly of the heaven of sovereignty over others' transformations, an assembly of demons, an assembly of Brahmas, and so forth, up to and including an assembly in the Akanishta heaven. He accords with each kind of being and appears in a form appropriate to teach them. All right, big chunk. So I introduced it by talking about um, the, we call it the, oh, come back. There we are. We call it the uh, universal door chapter, the Pumanpian of the Lotus Sutra where Kuan Yin Bodhisattva, when needed, as is appropriate, can appear in all these different bodies to teach at the right time for the right group. The Avatamsaka is saying the same thing here about assemblies. And what's an assembly? Well, you're looking at one, and I'm looking at two. Uh, you all, the Berkeley group, can't see through my screen. If I flipped it around, but I would lose my cables then. You would see the second assembly here in the Gold Coast. But these are assemblies, that's to say, where people come together to listen to the Dharma. And the sutra sketches that that's where the bodhisattva is showing up in order to teach. But understand that it could also be uh, the bodhisattva could be appearing in hospitals, in prisons, in armies, um, could be appearing uh, in union groups, in political rallies in swimming pool gatherings, you know, bowling alleys, in order to teach. So wherever people are listening to Dharma or able to be taught, that's where the Bodhisattva shows up. And that's why it's using assemblies as the criteria for, for all these different places. Okay, so let's take a look now at what it said. The Bodhisattva, keyword, adapts himself. Right? Does that change? And there's kind of, if you're like me, if you have a, a mind that moves towards cause and effect, you wonder what is, what's the flicker of change between the Bodhisattva saying, ah, there's somebody I can teach, and then pop, appears, adapts himself. What is that interval, right? What's the signal that goes out from seeing the need and answering the need. The sutra doesn't tell us that other than to say it's wu gong yong hang. It's effortless and it's, it arises from a vow, a wish to teach, and somehow that ability is there. That's all it says. So I guess if you ask Master Hua, he would probably say something like, 
do the meditation, find out yourself, then come back and tell us all, right? Don't ask me because you wouldn't understand that you haven't done the work. Um, you could ask the same thing from, let's say, uh, suppose you drove into um, the auto repair shop and said, my, my trouble light came on, my check engine light came on, um, I want you to fix it, tell me what's wrong and fix it. And you ask the master mechanic, you know, what, what was it that fixed, what, what did you fix, what changed? And he says, well, it was your Framus and your Gizmo that uh, had a filter and you know, I changed the adapter, you know, and it was fine. I just turned the wrench. And what, you know, what's the difference? He says, lady, here, here's the wrench, you turn it. You know, sir, you, you turn the wrench. So if you want to go deeper to say, how does it actually happen that he adapts himself? I can't tell you and the sutra doesn't tell you, but within that question, how does it work? The answer has to be something like make the vow and put in the effort and you'll understand know that this is the method and that's the result to to get deeper than that you have to actually do it but you can that's the point we can this bodhisattva has done that effort made the vows and now adapts himself to all the differences in bodies of living beings the faith of living beings things they understand and believe and he appears within their assemblies in their buddha lands how does he appear here we go he can appear as a monk or a nun, a shramana, right? Someone who goes to the ashram, ashramana. He can appear, he's, he will be one of the shramanas. He'll be a monk or a nun. Looks just like him. He can be a Brahmin. Understand that this is not limited to Buddhism. Isn't that interesting? Now, it's cast in the cult, the society of India because the sutra you know, the Buddha was an Indian prince. So we're getting a picture of Buddhist, of, sorry, we're getting a picture of Indian society. He appears as a Brahman within a Brahman assembly. Brahmins are not Buddhists, right? They are future Buddhists, future Buddhas and future Buddhists, but now they're in Hinduism, Brahmanism world. So the Buddha, the Bodhisattva appears right there with them. He appears as a kshatriya within the assemblies of kshatriyas. Kshatriyas were warriors. The prince, Siddhartha himself, was from a kshatriya clan. And if you're a kshatriya, that means your whole family, your aunts, your uncles, your extended family, all belong to the kshatriya clan. Kings, rulers, generals, warriors came from kshatriya clan. They were different from the Brahmins. The Brahmins were kind of a, not kind of, they were distinctly a uh, religious identity. Brahmins have rules they live by, clothes they wear, foods they eat, things they observe that are different from Kshatriyas. These, this is the way Indian society was divided, right? Brahmins were at the top, it's very vertical. Their job was to learn the Vedas, keep the sacrificial fires burning, and do the right pujas at the right time to keep the sun rising. My professor, my first Chinese, uh, third Chinese professor, was Amitendranath Tagore. He was the grandnephew of the great Tagore, Rabindranath Tagore. And he happened to be a Chinese professor of Chinese at Oakland University in Rochester, Michigan, and I showed up in the uh, 60s. And Professor Tagore was a wonderful man, great sense of humor, spoke good Chinese, loved poetry, and of course talked about his great uncle, the famous Tagore. And uh, Professor Tagore was both in the Brahmin world, but also being a scholar, he could talk outside of it to explain it. And he said, oh, yes, 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 he says, he says I know these professors, the, I know these, these Brahmins, these scholars, 
they feel that if they do not get up on time to make to keep the fire burning the sun will not rise it is their job their job to make the sun rise you can say and and he was he would you know laugh he says yeah they're a little bit attached to that but uh they believe it and it, did you notice the sun rose today so who's to argue with so they they did their job and the sun rose as always so so there we go that's the brahmins right and the the buddhists always um portray them as being slightly arrogant right hmm well from one point of view maybe but how important is the job of keeping the sun moving right so the brahmins are a distinct feature of the indian spiritual landscape forever and forever and so when you talk about hinduism that's not the language that hindus use right they that's a western scholars or imperialist colonial name for the, the multiple religious faiths of hindustan of sind right so those are brahmins kshatriyas are the second level down and they have a lot of the political power um they have a lot of the wealth but they their thing they don't do the sacrifices the way the brahmins do but they live within those that world view and their job is to govern their job is to keep uh other keep the boundaries of india safe and distinct when you come on down the third caste are the vaishyas and what do the vaishyas do they're the merchants vaishyas deal in material in in real stuff they get bargains they provide the the clothing that you wear the skills and crafts that keep the houses built and patched for, against the the wind and the rain and they don't do the rituals the brahmins do they don't do the governing the kshatriyas do but they do a good job of of keeping commerce flowing but then we get to this one the shudras which is the sutra's name for the outcasts and there are different names here is uh sho sho to sho to jong this is the avatamsaka sutra's name for the fourth and lowest caste in indian society the shudras and there are many other names um the current name are harijans harijans mean scavengers people who make their livelihood by uh picking up the uh cast off things of the other three and harijan also means children of god right so the outcast the, the lowest caste the shudra caste in india was had a very very difficult life and when i visited uh amdabad in gujarat last year for gandhi 3.0 conference with the uh service based community i learned a lot more about the life of the the shudra the the outcast the lowest caste the children of god the harijans and the the stories were uh shocking and believable because of the people who are telling the stories but just unbelievably brutal about uh, outcasts having to ring a bell as they walk down the street so that people who heard the bell could avoid meeting them because if the shadow if in the sun your physical shadow fell on a uh a member of the other three castes it could never be washed clean right if uh an outcast used a broom to sweep and then set the broom down anybody else coming to touch the broom would be tainted forever by having touched a broom used by the shudras that kind of uh 
lines being drawn among human beings. And interestingly, we're going to find out in a minute, the Buddha did not observe those external divisions among human beings. The Buddha looked within and found the Buddha nature and said, that's what I'm talking to, never mind the externals, even to the point where the Buddha spoke to non-humans. We're going to find out here, the Buddha was speaking to lay people, then he goes directly to the gods. He's talking to devas in the heavens. So this list goes on, right? We heard a list of people who our bodhisattva is trying to teach. These are humans, jishu, lay people. Then it goes right into the heavens. Look, here are the gods, the, the, the first of the desire realm heavens, four kings of heaven, heaven of the 33 gods, the next level, the suyama heaven, the next level, the tushita heaven, the next level, the bliss from transformation, the next level, and the heaven of sovereignty over others' transformations. Tahua tian, right? So then he goes to demons. Whoa, wait a minute. Our Bodhisattva is going to talk to demons. Why do they come above the gods? Uh, we had this conversation in our Avatamsaka Sutra lecture not long ago, which was this is a quick tour through Buddhist cosmology, how the heavens are built. Sure enough, the demon king, the king of the demons, lives at the top of the desire realm, just like who? Like the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament of traditional Judaism. Who's up there in the heavens? Well, Satan is. And Satan falls out of the heavens. If you read the book of Job, you discover the conversation between God and Satan talking about his filial disciple named Job. And they're up in the heavens talking about it. So how interesting, look, here is an ancient Buddhist world that, would just, that includes Hinduism and Brahmanism talking about the way the world is built, the way the heavens are built, that says the demons are on top of the desire realm, but they're not the bosses. They have somebody over them, Brahma, in the, the Brahma heavens, in the form realm, up to all the way up to the Akanishta heaven, which is the top of the form realm, where uh, the form realm ends, where everything is below to the top of the formless realm, right? So all of the heavens, he accords with each kind of being and appears in a form appropriate to teach them. So our bodhisattva here, in this one, in these two paragraphs, the sutra has taken our bodhisattva all the way from human realm to the top of the heavens to say the devas and says, he accords with each kind of being and appears in a form appropriate to teach them. Okay. Hmm. That's interesting. So what's that like? What in the world is going on here? Um, first of all, it starts from vows. It starts from somebody making that Bodhi resolve and saying, I'm going to maximize my potential. I'm going to be the best human I can be. What would that mean? What's the best human you can be? Well, here's an example. This is humanity uh, exploded large. Taken to its highest expression. We used um, some very mundane examples last time talking about like Microsoft Word, that's pretty mundane, right? A Microsoft computer project, product. And how many of us use every aspect, 100% of Microsoft Word? Well, I don't use Microsoft Word. I use Nisus Writer, 
But when I did have Microsoft Word on my computer, I couldn't possibly use 35% of what that software program offered me. I do keep Adobe Photoshop on my computer. Got a couple iterations of it. And Adobe Photoshop, um, I don't use 15%. I have my workflow that allows me to process, you know, my pictures that come out of Lightroom. And I shrink them and do some, uh, I embed a watermark and things like that. But Adobe Photoshop, let will let me make a movie you know in it that it'd be a funky movie but potentially um final cut pro is the movie editing software you can make a hollywood quality film out of final cut pro and yet these programs apparently are bottomless right now so we still some of us use this level of it, some use that level, some use, you know, most of the program, some need more power than the program offers, but rarely. Our human nature, our Buddha nature, pretty much identical, same thing, have these capacities in them to do things we don't ask it to do. And yet here's the sutra, been around in humanity for 2,500 years, saying, here it is, you know, anybody want to walk this path? Here's how you do it. Go from step A to step B, step B to step C, step C to step D, step D to step E, keep walking. And people who are still at step A can't imagine how somebody got to step H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, right? How much the more to the to Buddhahood, step C. There it is, waiting for us to walk. How interesting. Um, I'm going to step aside slightly and go to um, another chunk right here. Here we go. Take a look at this. Later on, not in this chapter but later on it's actually in chapter 39 of the same sutra called Rufa Jepin there's a conversation between Sudana who is a pilgrim a traveler and Maitreya Bodhisattva Maitreya Bodhisattva is the 50th encounter out of 52 Hi, Jerry. Uh, sorry for interruption. There seems to be some network uh, degradation on your side. The video become a, a little bit blurred. Okay. Just to make sure uh, no one else I'm is gonna... using a network. Okay. Nobody is. Nobody's online. Nope. See? Okay. I'll close that. And let's see what else is open here. Okay, I think I need everything that's open. Is that any better now? Has it calmed down? Um, it's, okay. it's about a second. Jerry, is it any better? Uh, not really. The video is still blurred, a little bit blurred. Yeah. Video is blurry. Yeah. Okay. It's not bad. It's not too bad, but it's not as clear as it was. At the beginning, yeah. Not as clear as before. Okay, nothing changed here as far as I know. But thank you for keeping me posted. We want to improve this. Okay, um, I'm going to show another uh, conversation here. Maitreya Bodhisattva. Sudhana and Maitreya are having a conversation. And Sudhana says, Maitreya Bodhisattva, when did you first make the Bodhi resolve? When did you do this thing? And Maitreya says, Shanansi, Ruwan Yu Wa Tsung He Chu Lai Zhe. Shanansi, Wa Tsung Sheng Chu, Mo Luo Ti Guo Er Lai Yu Si. Shanansi, Bi Yo Chu Luo Ming Wei Fang She. Fang She. Yo Changzi, Ming Chu Po Luo, 
为花七人临入佛法而注一笔，又为生出一切人民，随所应化而为说法，而为父母、居住眷属、婆罗门等演说大乘，令其屈辱，不注于彼，而从彼来。Okay, that's what he says. Here it is. So Sudana encounters Maitreya and says. When did you make the Bodhi resolve? Where did you come from? Maitreya says, oh, good man, you've asked where I came from. Good man, I come here from Magadha, where I was born. Good man, in a village called Fangsha, dwelling, there lived a son of an elder called Gopalaka, who sought to transform his community so that they could all enter the Buddha's Dharma. He also spoke Dharma for all the people in his hometown, each according to their potentials. He explained the Mahayana teaching for his mother and father, his family, the Brahmins and others, so they could develop an interest in it. That's why I lived there, why I came from that place. Okay, this is, I want to share this because here's an example from the Sutra of what the Sutra was talking about. Maitreya tells us, gives us a story of his past life. He says, I was an elder son, so high class family. My name is Gopalika. I wanted to transform my community. So very selfless wish here. Mm -hmm. He's a community organizer, kind of like President 44, right? He could enter the Buddhist Dharma. He's a community organizer. And he spoke Dharma for the people in the hometown. What did he do? Use music or use food, whatever, each according to their potentials. He explained the Mahayana teaching for people who, mom and dad, brothers and sisters, the local Brahmins and others, so they get interested in it. That's why I live there. That's why I came from that place says Maitreya. So look how filial Maitreya was and how that original filial wish powered him to become Maitreya Bodhisattva. So when I read that, I was touched. Wow, this is very interesting. Here's this famous spiritual classic, the Avatamsaka Sutra, boiling down to a wish to help your mom and dad, brothers and sisters, and Brahmins to get them to have an interest in this handbook of instructions for transforming your mind, for realizing your human potential. Cool. That's what it says. Pastor, there's a question from online. So the Bodhisattva. Yeah, go ahead. Um, the question is, how can the Bodhisattvas accord with the demon assembly? Um, gee whiz, how can the Bodhisattva accord with the demon assembly? Hang out in Las Vegas a lot? Become a Republican? Oh, no, no I didn't say that. Scratch that. Take that off the... Um, Remove health care from 9 million children. Take uh, 800,000 American children who came to this country, grew up in this country, but because you don't like them, send them away from this country to a place where they've never been and say you're on your own now. I don't like you. I get to define who's an American and who isn't, and you don't please me, so you go away. That's demonic. That, that is such a harsh thing to do. Cruel, senseless, reasonless, has no benefit to anybody, but is done entirely out of spite, just because you can't find the goodness in your heart to behave like a human being. So you behave like demons. Demons are made from behavior. Nobody's born a demon. So I don't know. I... I, I try to restrain myself from making political commentary, but sometimes you just have to speak out and say, that's wrong. 
to do that. Things don't benefit you or anyone else, but you do it anyway just because you, your mind is so fearful, so afraid of anything that doesn't accord with what you heard maybe growing up or somewhere. You don't have to be afraid. You need a huge quantity of fear to become a demon. So our bodhisattva would probably appear in front of demons and pat their head, give them a cookie, give them a cheeseburger, turn on their favorite rerun and say, go sit in the corner and behave yourself. Come out of that corner when you can behave, right? How do you speak to children? That way. Um, give them something to distract them, but don't, don't let them ruin lives. You know. So uh, that's slightly talking through my hat, but uh, I don't know, honestly, to tell you the truth, how would the Bodhisattva speak to demons? Probably go right to the heart of their fear. Um, that's my best answer. Otherwise, I'm just making it up, right? There's no, uh, actually, it's interesting. I recited the Earth Star Sutra the other day, and in the Sutra, you get to hear from two une- multiple people. There's Earth Star Bodhisattva is, uh, spends his full time in the hells. And there are demons in the hells, but we're living in a time when demons are appearing in human form as much as in the hells. And two of the spokespersons that we hear from in the Earth Star Bodhisattva Sutra are one is a ghost and one is King Yama, who is the god of the lord of the underworld. King Yama is, appears throughout folklore and throughout anthropological history. Every culture has got one, but this is a being. It's public servant is the way the, the Buddhists describe King Yama. Um, King Yama is there to take the newly dead and send them on their way to their next rebirth, right? The God of the underworld. And appears very much like a, uh, you know, like a judge who they say the way it works is you, you appear in front of King Yama, your screen, your, your uh, offenses appear on a screen that everyone can see, like that screen up there on the wall where we are infinitely replicating, where you're seeing images of yourself, watching images of yourself on images of yourself, right? So your offenses all appear on this screen and King Yama summons those beings whom you've harmed and says, you know, um, what did this person do? They say, he ate my leg. He called it a pork chop, but it was my leg, says the pig. He ate my wings. He called them drumsticks, but those are my wings, says the turkey. That's my breast meat, says the chicken. Uh, you know, he called it... Uh, finger licking good, and I called it my body. And so those creatures all come and testify. And King Yama goes, you go off and become a pig, a turkey, a chicken to repay. You can't argue that did you eat them or not? Well, they said you did. So I'm just here to keep score. King Yama is the keeps track, right? King Yama appears in the Aristotle Sutra and says, uh, Restore Bodhisattva is really wonderful. Those vows are incredible. And we want him to continue saving living beings in the places where most people don't go. Right? And the Buddha says, very good. King Yama is actually a Bodhisattva. Who comes next? Ghost kings. Kings of the ghost realm show up next. Restore Sutra is amazing because it interviews and includes voices not not only rarely heard, never heard, right? Voices from places like the hells, from places like the door between the hells, the nether realms, the yoming, 
Chet, the realm of darkness, where we go every time we leave our body according to these teachings and get judged and pass through, very much like a train station, like an airport hangar, uh, an airport uh, uh, terminal, you know, where we're in between, about to leave for the next destination. So the ghost kings show up and they say, right, Urstor Bodhisattva gets full marks. We approve Urstor Bodhisattva because he teaches beings how to avoid suffering in the realm of ghosts, which is where we live, where we see this incredible suffering. Urstor Bodhisattva is there to pull people out. We respect him. And the Buddha says, ah, good indeed. Thank you, Ghost King, Poisonless, and others. You are indeed a great Bodhisattva who has made vows to live in the realm of the ghosts to teach and transform and speak the Dharma. So it's like blink, blink, blink. I thought it was a ghost and it was scary. In fact, it's a Bodhisattva doing exactly what our eight stage Bodhisattva does, right? Which is appear in assemblies to speak Dharma as is appropriate. So how neat to have um, these other sutras from another time, another teaching in the Buddha's 49 years come and give a, from a slightly different angle so we can see the shadow, recognize the, the shape and the volume and tell a story. So how would the questioner online, Jerry said, how would the Bodhisattva teach demons? The Bodhisattva appears as a ghost king and uh, as a, um, as a uh, King Yama, the realm, of the, uh, the realm of the underworld, to, you know, speak the Dharma and to teach principles. Very cool. Very wonderful. So, more questions? How are we doing, Jerry? Um, that's good. Okay, all is well. I have a question, Dharma Master. Jinwei sure. do you have a question there? A question from, yeah, good, go ahead. The woman's side. <laughs> Hi, Dharma Master, I have a question. Dharma Master, can you hear me? I can't hear suddenly. I'm sorry, Ting Bujian. Amitofo. Dharma Master, can you hear me? Oh, there we go. Yes, I can. Go ahead, please. So my question is, uh, what is the difference between reciting a Bodhisattva's name to have, let's just say, Guan Yin transform and adapts himself or herself to various different bodies to teach the Dharma versus reciting Bodhisattva uh, name so that our true essential nature is awakened, to be awakened. Okay. Um, okay, thanks for the question. Everybody here? That was, right? Not so good. Uh, we're going to ask you to recite, repeat your question again. Let, let me see if I can say it the way I heard it. What's the difference between reciting the Buddha's name and having the Bodhisattva actually appear and reciting the Bodhisattva's name in order to wake up and get enlightened? Is, did I hear it right or you want to say it again? Um. So I'll, I'll repeat the question. I'm sorry. So the, okay. the question. Simple, simple. Simply. Yeah. Um, the question is to that. What's the difference between um, trying to awaken a tr true essential nature or a one's Buddha nature and transform internally okay. versus a Bodhisattva that's adapting himself or to herself? to all the various different bodies to teach the Dharma. Okay, I got it. So thank you. The question is, yeah, the question is, um, what happens when you get to that stage? Here, let me say it again. 
Your question is, what's the difference between a Buddha and a Bodhisattva, essentially, when you boil it down to? What I think the questioner is asking is, suppose you wake up, suppose you become enlightened and become a Buddha, what do you do then? Do you uh, stay in this land of Buddhahood? They call it in Chinese the Changji Guang Jing Du, the land of eternal, permanent bright light. Or do you strap on your tennis shoes and get out there and mix it up with living beings to teach and transform them? Something like that. And the answer is, it's different with every person, every spiritual being's vows, does it differently. For example, um, they say that Guanyin Bodhisattva, our familiar Guanyin Bodhisattva, was a Buddha at one point and saw that living beings were still suffering like mad and had already attained liberation and freedom from suffering himself, herself, and said, I'm not done. There's more work to go, more work to do. I'm going to become a bodhisattva. I'm going to come back as a bodhisattva to teach and transform. Guanyin Bodhisattva with a thousand hands and eyes uh, was made from that recognition, from that resolve. Yeah, I'm not done. So I guess the answer to the question is, it's up to you. If you want to ask me, how does it happen? Mm, it doesn't always happen. Some Buddhas, when they reach Nirvana, that land of eternal, still, bright light, stay there. And who can blame them? It's a hard road. Others come back to teach. Um, there's a part of chapter 40, our very same sutra, but the last chapter of our sutra. We're looking at chapter 21, the 10 stages. More chapters ahead. There's a description of the Pure Land, the Amitabha's Pure Land. And it says, once you get to the Pure Land, what's it like? What do you do there? And it says, you get trained to teach. You learn all the methods, all the the shan chao fang bian, all these skillful, clever, expedient methods to teach the Dharma for living beings in the Pure Land. So at that point, I guess the decision is made for you that you're going to come back. You're not done. Your, your job is ahead of you to teach living beings. That's what Buddhas in preparation do, it says. So that's my answer to the question is it's up to you and not everybody is the same. People do it differently. Is that satisfying? You okay with that? I have a question here from Hui Hui. I can't hear, sorry. Okay, we have a different interpretation. Go for it. Okay. Come to you and teach you versus reciting the name so that you come inside and realize. Ah. Uh. Bodhisattva, Bodhisattva, Lama, Spirit. She's asking why there's a difference. Okay. One is getting out of that to come to you, and another one is actually internalizing and realizing. Okay. That's how I understand it. We have a. Hui Hui is your Jirinja. She's, she understood the question differently and probably better than I did. One reason to recite the Bodhisattva's name, Namo Guan Shi Yin Pusa, Namo Guan Shi Yin Pusa, is because you have need. You're basing yourself on Guan Yin Bodhisattva's vows called Shun Shang Chiu Ku, hearing the sound and coming to relieve suffering. And if you do that, if you use Guan Yin's name that way, then it's not a lot different than prayer. It's Guan Yin Bodhisattva, come and save me, right? Please answer your cell phone, Guan Yin, I need you now, right? And your car goes off the road. 
So that's from you relying on the power of Guan Yin's vows, for example, or the any Bodhisattva's vows, first store two, for help. The help arrives. And that interaction between you and the Bodhisattva is essentially complete, right? There's another, so it's the answer to your question is, what's different is your intent. What are you asking for? What do you need, right? If you're reciting Guan Yin Bodhisattva's name in order to bring out compassion in your heart, in order to transform your ignorance, in order to get around your own greed, anger, and delusion, then again, your intent is different. For example, when I meditate, I recite the Great Compassion Mantra a lot. I keep the mantra moving in my mind. And my intent, my purpose, is to use the Da Pei Cho, the Great Compassion Mantra, as a like detergent, like a soap in there, power wash, to clean up my own nasty stuff, my own afflictions in my mind. And I count on it to do that. It's just like a kind of a track, another soundtrack in my mind as I recite, as I'm, as I'm meditating, the mantra that keeps moving along. And it goes kind of where is needed in what room of my mind to clean up the dust under the bed there. So that's a very different purpose. It's the same name, but it has a different purpose. And I think both are okay and both are available for you to use however you want them. Does that, does that make sense? Is that a better, that's answers way, way, and probably is a better answer to your question too. Thank you, Dharma Master. Okay, we got seven. Yes, go ahead. Is that Connie? Oh, was that a thank you? Did I hear a thank you? Yes, thank you, Dharma Master. Amitofo. You're welcome. Amitofo. Okay. Team effort. Thanks, Wei Wei, for the clarity. And you heard it better than I did. Okay. Yeah. Jin Wei Shir, I did not hear. Did you say oh. something I didn't hear? Why is Jin Wei Shir's mic not working? Okay. One more question, Master. When Hi, you, go for it. Uh, when you started off, uh, you translated uh, Puti Xin as uh, the resolve of a Bodhisattva. And I was curious about that because. Uh, Usually, I had understood that to mean a the an altruistic mind of a bodhisattva. So, do you um, have an equivalency between a puti xin and like a puti yuan, uh, or that kind of? Uh... Okay, could I ask your name? What What's your name? My name is Don. Don. Okay, Don. Yeah, thanks for the question. It, Don, did I hear it right? Okay, the um, how we translate it in English, gosh, there's a lot of variations in it. And that's why I think still here, what you saw was Bodhi Vow, Bodhi Resolve, Bodhi Chitta. Um, here it is in Chinese, Puti Xin. Bodhi is awakening, right? That's a familiar word. That's the basis of the word bodhisattva. And the root of that is bud in Sanskrit, which is buddha, awakened. Shin or chitta is just a thought. It's something that rises from your mind, my mind, and you recognize it and it powers you. It's like a battery spark. So the Bodhi and the Sanskrit for that is Bodhicitta. How we render that in English is not just one way. There's multiple ways to do it. Um, Master Hua allowed a, a bunch of different translations. He would say the thought of awakening. We would we translated it in in our translation group early as Bodhi mind, so the Bodhi mind. So in other words, a mind is kind of like a a whole ecosystem of thinking. Bodhi resolve, a resolve is like a a power bank, like a battery. It's 
more than just a thought that comes and goes. The Bodhi mind, the Bodhi resolve is like, I'm going to do it. There's oomph behind a Bodhi resolve. Um, resolution, right? I hereby resolve today that I'm from now on, I'm going to do it this way. So that's that word works, you know. So I'm hoping that in the future, other generations of translators will find better ways to translate Putishin, Bodhicitta, Bodhi Resolve. So, Don, how are you thinking of it? Would you say it again? What, what's your understanding of this word? I had uh, heard of it as the altruistic mind of a Bodhisattva. Hmm. Okay, I've the altruistic heard. mind of the Bodhisattva. It's um, the best translation I can give you right now, and given our time, this will be our, our last question. The Chinese have a way of, of translating it. They go, Shang Cheng Fu Dao Xia Hua Zhong Sheng, they say. And we used to go above become a Buddha below teach living beings. But I thought about that and that's that's a that's code language. And it's wrong to say above and below. It's not directional. The way I understand that now is ultimately my potential is perfect wisdom. In other words, Buddhahood. But immediately I'm gonna get there by Hua Zhongsheng, by teaching beings who my own greed, my own delusion, my own anger and rage, those are the living beings that I'm going to work on. When that work of Hua Zhongsheng, teaching living beings is done, my Shang, my ultimate potential for wisdom is right there inside me. That's the Bodhi result. It's saying, what am I capable of? Wisdom. I want to do that. If I'm a just a girl, you know, with all that's implied in that, just a girl. My potential for Buddhahood is full and complete, not deficient in the least. So just a girl, if you say, I want to be a Buddha, it's yours, you go for it. But how do I get there? You say altruistic mind of the Bodhisattva. Yeah, I get there by saying arrogance, I'm going to transform it to humility. Over, humil over humble, right? Too self-effacing. I'm going to starch it up and become confident, right? Fuzzy and deluded and not quite sure. I'm going to make my resolve diamond-like. And too austere and too scary and too uptight. I'm going to humanize and find my heart, right? So excessive, I'm going to cut it back. Deficient, I'm going to round it out so that you find this potential for wisdom. But you do that by embracing, embodying all living beings and all our incredible diversity. Sam, would you mind unpacking this guy? That's, that's how I'm understanding the Bodhi Resolve right now is recognizing two things, ultimate potential and immediately get to work on my own character flaws and strengths. That's the Bodhi resolve. So yeah, totally altruistic because you can't stop once you make that resolve. But you don't do it overnight. It takes time, obviously, to do it. Oh, thank you, Okay, Master. happy with that one? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Wait, wait. Sorry, I was answering here. Say again, Wei No. The potential without the resolve is. Uh huh. Yeah, the body Wei Wei here in in Gold Coast is saying. You need the, it's the, that resolve. You you need the that vow. That's why it's called the Bodhi vow. So yes, and yet when you boil it down, it's a thought. 
It's nothing more than a thought. But the Avatamsaka Sutra says the Bodhi resolve is Zhong Shan Zhi Wang, the king of all good things that a human being can do. There's nothing better to do with your life than make that vow. Everything changes at that point. You say, I'm, that's what I'm about. If I get a million dollars that comes through me, it's only to teach beings as I can use. If I don't get a penny in my life, it doesn't change anything about my direction and my purpose. That's the Bodhi resolve. All right. Okay, okay. Next week, we're going to continue with this section. And what I had queued up here, I had actually iTunes ready to go because there's a story here about someone known as Sunita, who is a perfect example of a Kshudra, a Shudra, the lowest caste, going on to become a Buddha after he meets his teacher, the Buddha. Um, I'm going to play a little bit. And Jerry, would you let me know if this works to play audio over my setup? Here we go. Raised one hand in a blessing with the sound of kindness for all the world. He said, come on. That was my ordination. I crossed over and my new life began. I live alone here in the mountains. I never tire of cultivate the way. Following my teacher's words, just as he taught me. With one mind, by night and by day. So, I'll, uh, Jerry, I'll talk to you during the week to see if that was good enough. If not, I wanted to play the recorded version of it because it sounds more full. But if it doesn't sound good enough, I'll just do it live next week. That's a perfect illustration of, of Sunita appearing in the body of a Shudra to teach all the Harijan, the uh, children of God, about, uh, um, about how they can wake up. Yeah, it says, not ideal like old time radio. It's good, it's from the CD called Dharma Radio. Oh, success, all right. Okay, meanwhile, that's next week, previews of coming attractions. Why don't we now, I'm going to shut down iTunes because it takes a lot of bandwidth. Why don't we now um, transfer the merit and thank you everybody for joining on Saturday night in Berkeley, California and on Sunday afternoon here in the Gold Coast. Um, we make a better world uh, by letting the Buddha's voice be heard. I will try harder to restrain my political commentary, but gee whiz. Um, yeah. All right, here we go. Dedication of merit. Please make a wish. Send your mind out around the globe, just like this signal traveling through the tubes of the internet. Here I see how 
hands and hearts can find in giving unity. They are one's way to great passion, wisdom, and to joy. They find this fine reward. They all who sorrow leave their grief and they They dispel the slime. Dispel the darkness of their endless night. Because our hearts of this world of pain turns into paradise. May all become compassionate and wise. May all become compassionate. Okay, may all become compassionate and wise indeed. And thank you all for joining. Uh, Jinwei Sher, would you lead everybody in bowing to the Buddha? And do we have any announcements, Jinwei Sher, you'd like to make uh, before we disperse for Berkeley? So, so we still have the winter break here at the monastery. Uh, until 28th of January and I guess it was it, it will be uh, February 3rd this Saturday when we start again our normal schedule and I will maybe update the next week about the Marty class and Doug Powers class uh, when they will start uh, on Wednesday, Stephen Taylor already started his class, and we have Thursday night uh, inside Berkeley Meditation Community. Uh, this coming Sunday, we'll have Theravada nuns who will visit uh, us as usual. And this is just it for it for now. Great. Okay. Lovely. Mr. Yap is back from journeying through the cold East Coast. There he is. Welcome. Uh, I have stories for you from Malaysia when I see you again. Okay. Omitofo. See you, everybody. Omitofo. Next week. Bye-bye.